Hello, <laughs> my name is Thomas Devaney, and I'm here to give a short introduction of the poems of John Ashbery, some poems by Ashbery. It's for my contemporary poetry class at Haverford College. It's English 289. It's March 23rd, 2020. So here it goes. Um, a lot of people say that uh, John Ashbery is a difficult poet, and in, in some cases he is, and in some cases he's not. Uh, some critics go so far as to claim that the poems are, quote, deliberately obscure, which I don't think is true, but I can understand very well why uh, some people might say that. Um, I remember in graduate school uh, in the spring of 1998, I was carrying around a copy of Ashbury's Select It, and I kept reading through it and reading through it, um, but it really was worse than slow going for me. I, really, I just couldn't find a way in to the poems. <clears throat> Yeah, it's true. Often I did enjoy uh, individual lines that you know I highlighted, I checked, but as the poem uh, continued, I I felt lost. I couldn't seem to follow the poem all the way to the end. That was one thing that I remember. So I started to become aware uh, that the more that I labored to figure the poems out, not only the less I understood them, but in fact the more taxing they became. Uh, my eyes glazed and I was just searching for an exit. <laughs> uh, so why did I continue after you know spending a certain amount of time? I, I did. I had a close friend who really liked Ashbury a lot and I very, I very much remember um, him saying very sincerely that he said, said I, I can't tell you um, how much um, you know that I love John Ashbury. And uh, I, he was reading Ashbury's new book at the time called Wakefulness. So you know I said give it a little bit more time, keep trying. Uh, so I continued to read Ashbury and I continued not to get it. <laughs> um, uh, I One day I remember exactly uh, the exact feeling that I had, um, which was I had the feeling that I was continuously looking over my shoulder as I was reading Ashbury. I was aware that there was something I was supposed to be getting and that I honestly was not getting. Uh, clearly, I was missing something. Uh, by this time, I think I put in about two months and I was just ready to stop reading the poems right there. Uh, I've just felt they kept pushing me out or you know, they never invited me in, uh, possibly both. Um, remarkably though, at the same moment, this very moment when I was literally um, aware of myself looking over my shoulders as I was reading Ashbury, um, I was reading the poem Soonest Mend It, S-O-O-N-E-S-T, Mend It, M-E-N-D-E-D. -E -E and I'll talk about the title a little bit later. Um, I was eight or li nine lines into this poem. Literally, there's a quote, uh, on the brink of destruction, <laughs> as the poem indicates. And I was just about to give up on the poem and Ashbury altogether um, when I read a funny line. Uh, it was kind of a cartoonish intervention almost, directly as if from out of nowhere. <clears throat> Here's the line. Happy hooligan. <laughs> Here's the line. Happy hooligan in his rusted green automobile came plowing down the course just to make sure everything was okay. So here comes this character out of nowhere into the poem. Um, okay. And then the poem began to describe uh, my feelings uh, of moving from one poem to the next and my growing confusion. The poem continues, uh, okay, here it's Happy Hooligan in his rusted green automobile came plowing down the course just to make sure everything was okay. Only by that time, we were in another chapter and confused about how to receive this latest piece of information. Now, um, I just remember kind of sitting there and my shoulders kind of dropping and relaxing for a moment. Uh, because I was, for, for, for the first time maybe, I was simply there in the poem. Um, I had not only stopped looking over my shoulder, which I didn't realize until later, but phrase by phrase, um, the poem was charting, you know, my own thoughts as I read the poem, literally. So, 
happy hooligan in his rusted green automobile came plowing down the course just to make sure everything was okay. Only by that time, we were in another chapter and confused about how to receive this latest piece of information. Our daily quandary about food and rent and the bills to be paid. Um, to reduce all this to a small variant, to step free at last, minuscule on a giant plateau. This was our ambition, to be small, clear, and free. So every time I teach Ashbury, I think about how long it took me to get there with the poems. And what I realize now that you know, it wasn't like, oh, the intuitive versus the rational, uh, you know, left brain analytical, right brain artist kind of thinking. But it was thinking in another way, uh, thinking in the ways in which we actually think. <laughs> uh, like whole brain, whole body, whole life uh, kind of thinking. Uh, that's it. This is my introduction. Uh, two other like footnotes. One is from Ashbury's friend Kenneth Koch. Um, who says Ashbury's poems are all about this kind of thinking. Uh, whole brain, whole body, whole kind of life, which is my, my phrase. But um, Koch says uh, the poems are, are all about this kind of thinking, full of just thinking. Not thinking of the kind that necessarily leads to any conclusion, but the kind of thinking that goes on in dreams, and the kind of thinking that goes on in daydreams and other imaginings, in memories, in momentary perceptions, in the back of our minds, the kind that we are barely aware of, that seems to go on by itself. And that's the Coke, uh, Coke quote. And this is the last uh, paragraph and last thought I'm gonna share. Later, uh, a few years ago, uh, <clears throat> I discovered a, a, a short little note on Soonest Mend It by the scholar and Ashbury biographer Karen Rothman. And her, she has some kind of helpful background notes on the poem. Uh, Rothman's notes and kind of like gloss, you know, and, and you know, a little bit of an analysis gave me a further hint about why this poem would hit me at that time in my life when I was desperately seeking to make not, you know, not only sense of Ashbury's poems, but I think I was also trying to make sense of my myself and the world and, and Ashbury's poems. And uh, so Karen Rothman writes, the title is a shorthand proverb. Least said, soonest mend it. A young John Ashbury heard it said by his strict Victorian grandparents, and he learned to keep things for, to himself. Following this precept, the poem avoids making a direct complaint, and the speaker says, we, not I. The poem is, however, an explanation of what it feels like to be an outsider. Uh, the first 35 lines describe struggling to grow up and to fit in, being conscious of not belonging. Then the poem offers uh, an understated and moving summary uh, of the opening section, quote, these then were some hazards of the course. Ashbury once described this poem as his, quote, one size fits all confessional poem, uh, which is a way of saying that the poem is aware of both the author's own child, childhood miseries, uh, growing up gay and artistic in a family and a small town that valued uh, none of those things, and that every person has his or her or their own story their own hazards, their own hazards of the course. Thank you.